thank you so much once again for your blessed Sabbath day. And we welcome you and your Holy Spirit here to be amongst our number. Sometimes life's hard, as you know, and we've talked about that. And I think today, once again, a pause for Shirley Smith's family. And I also think of all the other people who are struggling in this church, either with illness or with pain or with other things, maybe pain emotionally or physical. When I think of them, and I pray that you're with them because I know that they would rather be here with us, but they can't be. So please draw close to them and please help us to remember them and their prayers and their families also. Lord, today's offering is for the record. Um, it's a great thing that helps reach many people so they can read about what's going on. So we pray that people give generously for that. We also pray that people give generously with their tithes and you help them to multiply to do your work. Lord, I think of Parashka today who will be preaching your word and I pray that you use her as a vessel so that you can communicate your message uh, here to the congregation. Help them to be uplifted and help them to be revived and help them to want to serve you. We thank you once again for all your love and please forgive us when we have done the wrong thing by you. I love you. This church loves you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You know, it was just last weekend when we had our annual Easter camp. If you don't know what that is, you're a visitor. It's when Seventh-day Adventist churches combine together for a big memory event. And uh, I remember that one day, one thing I don't forget anymore is to get a pair of gloves before I go there and start putting up tents. And I remember that as we were put, putting up tents, uh, it came to tying ropes and I put down my gloves because you can't really tie ropes in a glove. And next time I look around, the gloves are gone. And there was somebody who was volunteering his time to help us, and I can see my gloves on him. And I thought, no, I can't do that. So I went ahead with my job, bare hands, and Sandy, yes, I did get a number of splinters in my hand. And one went very deep, and every single time I grabbed hold of anything, it hurt so deeply. And when I get home, I ask the medical person in the family, that's my husband, to, honey, please help, it really hurts. And he looked at it, he said, it's very deep, and he came with the pin, and I said, no, 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 no. And I closed my eyes, and then I started very gently screaming and yelling, and just, <laughs> and he looks at me and said, honey, I haven't even touched you yet. <laughs> So splinters are painful, and sometimes when God says, I want to take, I want to help you to get rid of it, we even scream before he even touches us. So thank you for the lesson. I very much appreciate it. Now, you probably are all familiar with this little booklet that uh, many of us, if not all of us, are following. It's a Bible reading plan for the year. And in the last few weeks, I heard some quite interesting stories, how some of you are progressing through the reading. So I would like to ask Lisa and Kevin to come up to the front, because I would like to ask them a couple of questions. Um, I know it has been a tremendous blessing to me, and um, I would like to ask you to tell us about your Bible reading plan. How do you do this? Well, I do it in the mornings while I'm having breakfast, um, and I have to confess it doesn't happen every morning. And I started trying to catch up, but that doesn't work very well, and it feels too onerous. There's too much to catch up, and I think, no, I haven't got time to catch it up. I just won't worry. So that wasn't working. So then I thought, I'll just do the day that we're on, and if I've missed a few, that's okay. So I just do the day that we're on, um, and sometimes it's a bit deep. Sometimes the stories are a bit emotional or a bit low and I think oh, I don't feel like that today I want something a bit brighter to brighten me up and so I'll choose one of the other passages we have four to choose from and so I'll choose one of the other passages that might be a bit brighter and give me a bit more hope for the day or a bit more joy for the day mm, thank you very much Lisa Kevin how about in your household yeah. what happens in our house um, is this 
Yeah, Lo and I um, do our readings in the morning with our Sabbath school lesson. We do that together. And then at night time we read through this each day. And we've found that to be really, really good. We've read through the Bible quite a few times, but when you read the Bible through, you just go zoom, zoom, zoom. But when it's... Oh, yeah. Okay, thanks. Now you can hear me? Oh, oh that's terrible. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yeah, so in the evening we, uh, we, we go to bed and we sit and we read uh, through this thing. But uh, as you probably know, when you've read the Bible through from cover to cover, it's not that interesting. You know, you sort of get along. But the way they've planned this is really, really good. And I encourage you to... Uh, to do this Bible reading plans because there's things in there, even though you might read the Bible five or six times, there's still things that you learn as you go through and uh, I'd like to encourage you to, to uh, do this reading to, uh, to help you on your spiritual way. Thank you. Now, now Kevin, have you ever missed a day or parts of a day's reading? Um, no, we've, we've missed it at night because we come to our prayer meeting here yes. for the 10 days, then we do it in the morning. Wow, that is inspirational. So, thank you for that. Look, one more last question. Uh, Lisa, you read through the Bible a number of times. Mm -hmm. have you, do you find anything new or it's all something that... No, I have found something new. A bit of trivia this week. I was reading about Samson. How many wives did Samson have? Can we vote? Did he have one wife? Did he have two wives? Did he have three wives? I think you better all go home and check the story. I think he had one wife and one lover. <laughs> so you, I found interesting things, but I did find with Samson that even though I've read that story over and over, I thought I knew all the facts, but I found I didn't this week. Samson made some choices that perhaps weren't God's best choices for him, but God was still always there with him, and I've found hope and encouragement in that, that even though the choices I make are not always God's choices, he's still always there with me. All right, thank you very much. I really appreciate uh, you coming up and sharing your journey through the Bible. If you have any stories, any inspiration, please come and see Pastor Derek, myself, or any of the elders. We want to hear your stories, and we want to share it with other people, how you do it, and how you're finding it. So this week... If you follow the reading, we're reading through Judges, some of Luke, getting into John, and again some Psalms and Proverbs. And um, I got booked down by the person Jephthah this week, because once I read his story, I said, I want to look into it deeper. And you know, hours went by looking at the original, how it went, and then looking up Ellen White writings, and I found it fascinating. Uh, his story. Um, but the one that weighed very heavily on my mind this week was Psalms. Every single day we have a reading from Psalms. And I have to tell you when I became a Christian, I was a teenager when I first heard about God. I was at a very deep point of my life. And when I got a hold of the book of Psalms, I could not stop reading it. So this time around, and I read it a few more times, but this time around, I somehow found that the stories were more interesting and speaking more to my heart than the Psalms every day. And I started asking the question, why? Why is that I don't have the same engagement with this book like I had initially? And uh, this is the structure of Psalms, that it's very close to other uh, structures that you can find around. And if you find it, if you're a visual person and you find it helpful, I've got some copies here that you can take home. I'll hand them out at the end. Keep it on your desk, pin it up on the board in your study, or have it in your Bible if you ever would like to cross-check it. So now to answer the question, why is it that Psalms didn't or hasn't resonated with me that deeply as it did initially? It has to do with this part, the lament and the praise. And as you heard initially at the beginning of Psalms, they're up to book 104, 105 now, or, or chapter 105, there is more lament. 
And as I was struggling and coming in grips and in terms with my newfound faith and my circumstances at that time, I really resonated with David's lament. But through as I read it and as I resonated with it, slowly the lament was overtaken by praise and more and more praise. And the way he dealt with it, the day, way he put it in perspective, that pain has a part to play, I learned to process my pain and I learned to submit it to God's will. So that's why initially it had such a big impact on me. And now in the last few weeks it's starting to resonate with me because I'm not as much in the lament season of my life for now, but more in the praise and it's more and more coming alive. So as we said, always be joyful. It was quoted last night. Never stop praying. Be thankful in all circumstances, for this is God's will for you who belong to Christ Jesus. And here it says, be thankful in all circumstances. Not for all circumstances, but no matter what life throws at you, you can still choose to be thankful. So here are the two core messages of the Psalms. The first one is in chapter 1. Or oh, the joys of those who delight in the law of the Lord, meditating it on it day and night. And that time the law was the five book of Moses. But then more were added to it, not replacing it, but new additions like Psalms, like, like Proverbs, like all the prophets and in the New Testament. And now we hold in our hands an amazing uh, God-inspired word of God that is the Bible. And it calls to our attention the principle that if you want to find joy, then you delight in the law of the Lord, in everything you learn about him, everything you read about him, meditating on it day and night. So it draws our attention to regularly read and meditate on God's word, the Bible. And in chapter 2 we read, How blessed are all those who take refuge or shelter in him. It makes our eyes focus on Jesus. Because without him, we are nothing. And it says, fix our eyes on Jesus and his promises. Because they are true and they are going to come true. So these two are the messages how Psalms can be summed up into. Now Craig Miller once pointed out that since 1980s, our life has taken a very hectic and very fast-paced um, rhythm. And I think we can all associate with that. Uh, often when I come in the door and they, I ask people, how are you, how was your week, busy? It's almost like a cliche, busy. But because of this hectic lifestyle, our relationships are struggling. And it applies not only to our horizontal relationships, when I hear more and more of you saying, I wish I could have more time with my family. I wish I could have more time with my children. But it also affects our vertical relationship with God. Uh, yesterday, I mean last week, after, after luncheon, somebody came to me and, and said, you know, my life is just so busy, my regular life, that I have less and less time for my God life. I said, oh, tell me more about it. And she shared with me that because of all the requirements and the pressures of life, that special time she had with God is almost, you know, diminishing. And then I asked her, what if your regular life and your God life were not supposed to be separate, but somehow intertwined? And she said, so how does that look like? And you know, I believe that the book of Psalms is teaching us how our everyday life can be intertwined with God's life. The two are inseparable and we shouldn't separate them. So as our relationship struggles with God, 
we do have to make sure we do find quality time for him. That somehow the, the words that we read, they are not only words, but they become knowledge. And the knowledge that something we meditate on becomes life. And we are going to live out God's words. There was a couple once, and, and they had three children. And they were a typical 21st century family. Um, they live busy lives. Soccer, basketball, music lessons, pathfinders, you name it. She was a housewife, volunteered at the school and the local hospital, and also was returning to part-time work. He was a civil engineer and had a head of department at work. They both entertained frequently at home, and they were both very busy people who led very busy lives. But they had a way of showing their love for one another. Their conversations throughout the week might have been very fleeting and brief, but once a week, one evening, always the same evening was sacred to them. They never missed, and nothing could ever interfere with that evening. That night, they go out to a restaurant. Sometimes they go out to watch a movie, or they went for a walk, maybe cooked together, or just stayed at home and read. But it was their night. And it was sacred, and it was the key for their relationship. And if you're married, you know the secret of these dates that are key to keep a relationship going. Now, if it makes sense that spending sacred time together is good for a marriage, how much more important is sacred time spent in prayer, meditation, and communion with the Lord is important. So this morning, the question is, how committed are we to follow the wisdom and the direction set out in the, in, uh, in the book of Psalms? That no matter how busy our lives are, no matter how disturbing, joyful, happy, whatever life throws at us, we are going to commit significant time to God and to his word so that it can transform our lives. Now, prayer plays a significant part in this very, very road. So much so that when Jesus, who lived a very busy life, he said the report of his power spread even faster and vast crowds came to hear him preach and to be healed of their diseases. But Jesus, how frequently? Often withdrew to the wilderness for prayer. If Jesus needed that time who was sinless and he was continually in contact with his father, how much more do we need that time? Now, when we pray, there are different stages that we go through. And very briefly, I would like to touch on these stages. The first stage is the prayer of desperation. Uh, in fact, it's almost involuntary, this type of prayers at times. Um, it would be safe to say that most of the prayers and the requests uttered to Jesus in the Gospels fell in this category. The prayers often are not calm, not offered in spiritual manner, but abruptly wrung out of someone by a terrible infliction or pressing emergency. We can see the blind man, the paralyzed man, the mother who is whose daughter just passed away. We see sick people, demon-possessed people. And let's not forget about the desperate plea of a father whose daughter was dying. Can't prayers, prayers, not likely. I believe that as we face tragedies and trials, when we find ourselves, our loved ones, in desperate situations, 
there is a natural tendency placed and imprinted in our heart by God himself that urges us to cry out to him for help. And often it is by cries as such that people discover a prayer life and a relationship with the Lord first begins. And when they cry out time after time in desperation, desperation, they realize that often their plea for help from God is because of something that we continually do wrong. Maybe we are at fault of the situation we find ourselves and thus the next uh, level of prayer is born the prayer of confession. Through this particular prayer, we are essentially telling God that he is right and just, and we realize that we ourselves have much to be desired when it comes to our righteousness. We get to this stage as we grow deeper in our walk with God, because the closer we are to God, the more we realize our imperfections and our unrighteousness. Perhaps one of the most famous prayers of confession is the prayer of David that is recorded in Psalm 51. Have mercy on me, God, because of your unfailing love, because of your great compassion, blot out the stains of my sins. Wash me clean from my guilt. Purify me from my sin. His guilt was weighing heavily on him when he uttered this prayer. David almost definitely understood along with confession must come repentance because confession without repentance worth not much. It's turning away from that sin and doing our best. John says in chapter 1, but if we confess our sins to him, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all wickedness. And then he goes on saying, if we claim we have not sinned, we are calling God a liar and showing that his word has no place in our hearts. So just as Psalm says, focus on God's word and focus on Jesus, the Messiah. John does the same in the New Testament. Keep your eyes on him because he is the one through him we can have forgiveness. And so we get to the third stage of prayer, the prayer of supplication. At this stage of prayer, when we ask God for things, but because of the stages we've been through, and, and as David went through these stages, he didn't ask for a faster horse or a shinier sword or, or more caves. He asked for things, Lord, hear my prayer in Psalm 86, protect me, save me. Be merciful to me. Give me happiness. Teach me your ways. Grant me a purity of heart. The very things that are the fruit of the Spirit that he was asking for. Please give me peace. You know, everything that comes under this category of prayer is, is because of God's mercy. We do not deserve anything in this world. Every blessings that come from God is his because of his mercy. So if you sinful people know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your heavenly father give good gifts to those who ask him? He says, ask, but ask for the right things with the right motives. So again, these three stages of prayer that we talked about so far, are not merely disposable. They're still part of a Christian walk. But there is one level that takes us much deeper. And these three are all focused somewhat on self, about us. But the next stage of prayer is a prayer of submission. Total and conditional submission to the will of God. It is only as we reach this point in our spiritual journey do we truly experience joy and peace. 
Joy we talked about last night in a prayer meeting and tonight we are going to look at this. Would you like to have joy in your hectic life? Would you like to have peace? Then probably this is the answer to it. To reach this stage of prayer, one has to be so focused on the will of God that self is utterly and completely lost. Oh Lord, I give my life to you. That sentence sums it up. My life is in your hand. I trust in you, my God. The Lord is good and does what is right. He shows the proper path to go to, go, to those who go astray. If you look through scriptures, all the great men of faith have achieved this level of complete trust in God. One person I can think of is Stephen, the martyr for the gospel. Even as he was stoned to death, you know what he was doing? He was praying for the people who were stoning him. He was genuinely concerned about the salvation of those men who were murdering him. If you read Acts chapter 7, you will see that it was because he was totally focused on Jesus. He saw beyond his present circumstances and found absolute peace with God. That is what a prayer of total submission is all about. You know, when Jesus was here on earth and he came to the end of his, his life and his ministry, he knew why he came for. But in that garden of Gethsemane, he prays the prayer according to Matthew three times. And he says this, Father, if you are willing, please take this cup of suffering away from me. Yet I want, yet I want your will to be done, not mine. From his human perspective, he preferred not to go through it. It was scary, like taking out a splinter from your hand. It's scary, like dealing with the one sin that bonks you down, whether it is the result of other people's doing or your doing or just circumstances. We say, no, 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 it's too hard. And Jesus was there, but at the end he could say, yet I want your will be done not mine. He completely surrendered his will to the Father. Did he struggle with it? Yes, he did. And so do we when we embark on this journey. But the call is there to follow his example. Jesus placed himself then to the custody of those whom he knew would carry out the unthinkable. But if you read how Jesus conducted himself from this point on, you realize that he wasn't carried to the cross, kicking and screaming. He didn't fight back or even talk back at the guards. But as a lamb being led to the slaughter and as a sheep before its shearer is silent, so he did not open his mouth. He was totally submissive to the will of his father. Sure, he expressed his desire not to drink the cup, but again he finished his sentence, yet not my, my, not my will, but yours will be done. The question is, could we say this very same thing in the most difficult circumstances in our lives. Could you leave a hospital after you have been diagnosed with terminal cancer or kneel at the bed of your dying child and say, not my will, but yours be done? The simple answer is no, we can't. Not without the presence of the Holy Spirit in our lives can we truly submit to the will of God. That is the only way we can do that. So right throughout Psalm, we learn that the faith is the key to prayer. And on the other hand, prayer is the key to this faith. Prayer strengthens our faith. 
and allows us to trust God and his love for us, to know that he will always act in our best interest. So the last four nights or three nights we have been gathering here because as leaders of the church we believe that individual and corporate prayer is something that we have to hold at an uttermost priority. And we've been gathering at 10 days of prayer and we heard about joy and tonight we are going to hear about peace. And I heard some amazing stories. There were two people who told me in the last three nights, you know, I came, but you know, as I came, I, at the end, I didn't even want to be here, but I was on the way, so I came, and I was so glad I came, because I left as a different person than when I came in. You know, last night when I was driving down here, there was a major accident on the Narrows, and all five lanes were closed. And even as I was driving and I had to do the major detour and I said, I'm going to be late. I'm going to be so late. What's the point? But I still came and I'm so glad I came because the time I spent together in prayer with the people and there were a number of groups praying around was exactly what I needed. So there you go. These are the lessons and the wisdom and the principles in Book of Psalms that although it was written thousands of years ago, the principles are still the same. Regularly read, know and meditate on God's Word, the Bible, and fix our eyes on Jesus and His promises. So these words are ancient words, but they are here to change us, but they can only change us if you spend time in them. Amen.